Hey, hello everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here with you at Peak Prosperity, and I am really pleased to be welcoming today's guest. We have Professor St. Ange here with us today. You've probably seen him on Twitter. If not, you got to check him out. He's a, um, a professor, PhD in economics, is it? it? Economics, yep. Yeah, so uh, obviously knows a lot about finance and economics. And as you know, you got to learn about this topic because if you hated the 99.95% survival rate of COVID, you are not going to like what happens if the monetary accidents that we think are coming happen. So I want to talk to Peter about that, get his point of view on all this. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Chris. Oh, it's great to have you here. Great to have you. So um, let's start here. So uh, your background, because you you first came on my radar screen maybe three, four months ago, and immediately I followed you on your first video. I was like, oh, that's a follow, because I I recognize somebody who speaks well, has organized thinking, and knows what they're talking about. So that's all three things I value. So uh, how did you suddenly pop on the screen? Uh, well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so I started doing videos about four months ago, just kind of talking through what's happening in the economy. Uh, my background, so I'm a PhD economist. I started out actually in corporate marketing in telecoms equipment and then in toys. So I was a strategic um, marketing at Takara Corporation out of Japan, which does the Transformers mm -hmm. robots in disguise. Uh, and then I went back for the PhD, taught in Taiwan for about five years, which was glorious. I loved it. You you know, mm -hmm. there there is no wokeness. The Taiwan was a military regime until relatively recently. And so especially the senior professors, I mean, they're, they're, you know, socialism was not a factor in Taiwanese yeah. universities. The younger professors, it's changing because uh, they get their degrees in the U.S. Uh, but anyway, so that was a very fun experience. And the videos actually come out of that. So, you know, I was teaching MBA students and before class, I would do like a little three, five minute shtick about whatever is happening in the news just to make students feel like it's relevant and also to get them out of bed because they're hungover <laughs> yeah and uh, you know so that's more or less what i do now but you know instead of teaching a uh, curriculum on strategic marketing or something i just do it with the uh crap show that is happening in the news nowadays well absolutely so um if if i could you know uh well my my audience is used to this i speak in in slides so um, let me just pull up a couple of slides here real quick and we can get started. Uh, let me know, is this, are, are you seeing that well or is it? Yep. Yep. All good. good. So, all right. So um, everybody can read this standard disclaimers. None of this, this is all purely educational. So this is uh, Peter's, uh, it's uh, Professor Stange there, ST Ange at um, Twitter. So you can follow him there and you, you got a, a nice chunk of followers. I noted that 114 people I'm following are following you. So we got some good crossover Ooh, there. Okay, good. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's always a good sign for me. Not that I need an echo chamber, but if, <laughs> you know, my people recognize quality and vice versa. It's um, it's so, good that, yeah, that people are finding new content. So yeah, definitely. Absolutely. It was not like that a couple of years ago. So no, it sure wasn't. So um, I'm going to start here with this one. So you just recently had a piece July 22nd about the gold back bricks. I want to talk about this because, Peter, we, we've got um, uh, that meeting's coming up soon. And I, a lot of my followers had questions. What does this mean? What is a brick? What's, what is gold back currency? What, what does any of this mean? And I know there's a lot of open questions about it, but I'd like to talk about it because it feels seismic to me. Yeah, so BRICS is a collection um, of countries that are trying to find an alternative to what they see as the uh, hegemonic dollar-based U.S.-run global economy. So BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And now there's something like 30 countries, 30 or 40 countries that are interested in joining this grouping. And Probably if you had to identify a single country, it's China that's really leading it. And China is very interested in setting up an alternative uh, sort of world hegemon uh, to the yeah. U.S. So they don't necessarily want to play by the U.S. rules. Uh, they don't want to be, from their perspective, bullied by the U.S. And a big shift in interest towards escaping the dollar for a lot of these countries was what happened to Russia 
uh, when Putin invaded Ukraine. So for decades, ever since the dollar kind of took over in 1945, it had been sort of understood that even if countries don't like each other, you keep the dollar out of it. You keep the monetary system out of it. So, you know, the logic being that you want your enemies to be dependent on you as well. And so during the Cold War, the U.S. and Soviet Union had many wars going on all over the world. Many of these were hot. You know, of course, Vietnam and Korea were tragedies. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then, we did not go after the dollar. But what happened in the wake of the Ukraine invasion is that the U.S. seized Russia's sovereign dollars. And that was about $300 billion worth, which in perspective... Right, relative to the size of the Russian economy, that, that would be something like four trillion in our terms. All right, so that was an enormous percent of Russia's national wealth, and it was seized presumably to try to set off a banking crisis. Now, ironically enough, for separate reasons, our banks crashed. Uh, but anyway, that didn't work. Oops. But the problem, yeah, the problem is that every country on Earth saw that happen. All right, you've got now all these countries that they were never really hostile to the U.S., but they're starting to wonder now, could they come after me? Could they try to crash my banks? You know, from these countries' perspectives, if the U.S. manages to crash your banks, then that could lead to massive civil unrest. You could have civil war. They could end up like Muammar Gaddafi in Libya getting shivved mm -hmm. in the street. Right. So this is an existential fear for these countries. And it, I mean, indeed, leaders have been coming out. The president of Indonesia, he was speaking at a group of Southeast Asian countries, and he literally said, we have to you know, get out from under the dollar because look what happened to Russia. All right. right. So those sanctions really accelerated the talk. And so now BRICS had been sort of flirting with a dollar alternative for a long time. Uh, but at this point now it's accelerating. And so they've got a meeting coming up in August. And mm -hmm. one of the items that may or may not be on the agenda is the prospect of a gold backed BRICS currency. Uh, the Russia, the what is it? The, the Russian embassy in Kenya originally announced it, which is kind of a goofy way to announce things. And yeah, so it's a little weird. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you might expect it to come from the Kremlin. Um, but anyway, you know, they first kind of got the ball rolling. Both China and Russia had been flirting about gold backing for a long time. And so, you know, this this didn't really shock anybody. Uh, South Africa is now saying, no, it's not on the agenda. And so it's an open question. But if you sort of zoom out, what I think is interesting is that if any country did gold back a widely used currency, that would uh, I mean, it would be catastrophic for the U.S. dollar, right? That would give the world an alternative sort of payment rail that is even stronger than the dollar is today. Now, the way it would be structured, most likely, and, you know, again, we don't have the details yet. We may get some out of this next meeting. Uh, I think the most likely way that it's structured is not that they would gold back their own currency, right? Like they wouldn't gold back the ruble or the Chinese yuan, Instead, they would create a new trade currency, like a separate currency, and they would use that for trade between, initially, between the BRICS countries. That might be what they gold back. And if they do, then that would be a stronger, right? It would hold its value better than the U.S. dollar. And so that might lure other countries into it to use it for trade. Now, if you're using a currency for trade, you automatically start using it for financial flows as well because the transaction costs are much lower. Mm. And so if that were to happen, now there's a lot of ifs there, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying this is extremely likely to happen next Tuesday, but if that were to happen, then that could start draining enormous amounts away from the US dollar. That would make the US dollar weaker. It would make inflation here much higher. You know, if we sort of extend to what's possible, Again, not what's likely, but what's possible. We can look back to the 1997 financial crisis in Asia, and there you had currencies drop by like half or more. Right, right. So let me go rewind. So it was it was February 28th, 2022, when when the United States froze Russia's sovereign dollar reserves, which which proved they were neither sovereign nor reserves. This was this was the the dollar's been used as a club. exactly. Right. But this time right. it was weaponized 
that was a really great point you made that that's actually uh, that makes sense that this was an attempt to completely destabilize the the financial system of a country which is is as bad as anything that could happen um because that really will destroy an entire country lickety split yep so yep. seeing that it it can only make sense for countries to conclude kind of like north korea concluded maybe i should have a nuclear bomb you know there's a certain you know conclusion you can come to which is like i should be not totally vulnerable to that right you know so yeah, it, it and, seems like that's yeah. what these countries have, have really concluded but you know it's it's been many decades in the making it seems but that rush i was surprised you mentioned what 30 countries are sort of raised their hands and said can we can we join this new club yeah and you know these are countries that have long been traditional us allies so mexico has expressed an interest saudi arabia which is the linchpin of the petrodollar system you know, yep. these are not like Yemen or Syria or something, right? These are sort of legitimate countries yeah. uh, that have yep. long been in the U.S. orbit. And I think you made a great point comparing it to North Korea's nukes. You know, there's a certain you don't want to make your enemies feel so insecure that they are going to go with the nuclear option, right? Either. Mm -hmm. If you've decided that they are your enemies, then you must crush them, okay? But if you don't plan on crushing them, then you kind of got to find a way to live together because otherwise that's exactly what they do. They start reaching for the nuclear buttons. And financially, the nuclear option is a gold-backed currency. Now, it would be fantastic for humanity in that sense, right? I mean, I would, I, I would love nothing more than to have some viable gold-backed common-use currency. But in terms of the U.S. dollar or in terms of America's ability to project power around the world, a gold-backed currency, right? If the U.S. keeps pushing these countries, that would be the nuclear solution. And, you know, in fact, this administration across the board, it has really made foreign policy secondary to domestic politics. So whether it's green policy, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, social policies having to do with the family, uh, it's put a lot of pressure on countries, including Japan, a longtime ally. They're having a debate right now about yeah. social policy. I'm not sure if I can say exactly what that is. Um, mm -hmm. And at any rate, the U.S. is intervening. And, and you know, there have been a lot of complaints in Japan about sort of uh, intervention in domestic policy. Traditionally, the U.S. had had a very grown up approach to foreign policy, which is that you guys do whatever it is you do. Right. If you have conservative electorate and, you know, they've got issues with uh, with social policy, you do it the way you will. Uh, but now this administration in particular has really moved that to where these countries may feel like every last issue, including how they do their schools, how they do family policy. They may feel like all of those things are, could also potentially be grounds for the U.S. to come in and start trying to crash their economy. It's exactly what happened with Uganda. They had a relatively uh, conservative social law that came in and the Biden administration started hinting at, you know, re reviewing their duty free access to the U.S. market uh, at, you know, uh, financial or trade sanctions against Uganda over social policy. Right. So it's one thing if a country knows that the rules are you're not supposed to invade your neighbor. Most countries aren't interested in doing that. But on the other hand, if now a country has to worry, you know, they have to like keep tabs on every activist who goes visits the White House because who knows what green policy or what social policy is now gonna be used to ultimately weaponize uh, the US economy and weaponize the dollar against them. Yeah, so th this is a very interesting point um, because uh, when when the United States left Afghanistan, and that's as euphemistically polite as I can be about that, um, we'd had diversity targets for their army. Right. So we wanted yep. the Afghan army to be X percent women. And that made a lot of sense to us. We were busy enforcing that, which makes about as much sense to me in that culture as uh, enforcing veganism on Inuits. You know, right. Uh, right. It, it's just it's just inappropriate um, in the constraints of that culture. But that's what we were doing now. Probably a decade ago, I was in China. I was talking with a very high level Chinese person whose name, you know, has been in the news uh and we were having a very frank conversation because i talk about resource issues and i'm like why doesn't this is 10 years ago i'm like why does my country not understand oil and its importance to the overall underpinnings of your economy um and, and so the conversation went on and i was trying to understand belt and road at that point in time and he said to me look mm -hmm. chris the business of china's business the business of the united states is war um yeah. and 
what he meant by that was that that that's uh, we've always had a club that's sort of been our approach we take the club china takes the silk carpet out and makes people feel good and between the two things given a choice you know the club or the carpet it turns out a lot of people are, are actually liking the way china is approaching them now i'm not saying it's yeah. going to be all bells and you know in whistles and, and roses going down that path but it really feels to me like this is a a tidal wave potential that's why i said this is possibly one of the most significant events i've heard about whether it happens or not right now this gold back currency but can you put this in the context of well tying it all together everybody's favorite um except 100 year old dude centurion uh henry kissinger was just in china he is the yeah. grandfather or father of uh the petrodollar and we just saw china engineer a deal a diplomatic detente between iran and saudi arabia Oh, yeah. Amazing. So can you put all, I mean, I put a lot of dots on the board for you, but they feel connected to me. Am I making too much of this? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, uh, what you said earlier about China coming in with uh, trade and um, benefits for the home country, and then, you know, the U.S. kind of dealing with war. I think that's absolutely correct. That's been the policy of China really ever since the 60s, where, you know, uh, the non-aligned movement, Right. China was trying to create this third alternative to the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And their deal had always been we don't interfere in your domestic policy. OK, we are tolerant. We respect others. Uh, you can do anything you want at home. And China's actually strengthened that now uh, where it, it, there was uh, Larry Summers related a story where he met with an African diplomat who complained that when China shows up, they come with a checkbook. When the U.S. comes, they come with a lecture, right? So China goes into these, say, African countries, just to give a uh, specific example, Angola. So Angola's got tons of oil. A lot of it is not well exploited because they have crappy local infrastructure, so they, they can't ship much. So China flies in, and China says, okay, here's a menu. It's almost like a lunch menu. Like, what would you like? Here's an airport. Here's highways. Here's trains. Here's housing. Uh, which country was it? I think it was actually Angola. They built like tens of thousands of houses because Angola had ridiculously high housing costs. Anyway, they come in and offer all this stuff. Among those things is, of course, going to be a uh, oil terminal and all of the infrastructure that you need to actually get your oil out of your country and sell out for money. All right. So mm -hmm. China benefits because, you know, they get this this new stream of oil. Angola benefits tremendously because they get free railroads and airports plus the oil was just sitting there. They weren't selling it. It, it. it wasn't doing anything. And so now they can actually sell it. Now, China's getting a friend price for sure. All right. But mm -hmm. in, I, I, I mean, Angola was selling it for zero previously. So this is one heck of a deal for all these countries. And, you know, if you line that up against the U.S., what is the U.S. bringing? I mean, if the U.S. is going to come in and lecture these countries about their union policy or social policy or, you know, tax rates, there's this tax cartel coming out of the G20 and the OECD. That's the alternative. It's pretty tough to win with that. And final point is what happens with the American people, right? So in China's case, they're coming in and cutting these deals with countries, and the majority of the benefits are going to ultimately the Chinese people, right? So Chinese consumers get cheaper products. They get cheaper gas prices. Chinese companies become more competitive because they can get all these assets. They can, you know, they also build the infrastructure, which is paid ultimately um, by the commodity sales. So everybody in China is benefiting from that whole arrangement. Now, contrast mm -hmm. with the U.S., you know, when we put great, beautiful walls around every road in Iraq, what exactly did that do for a mom and dad with two kids in Tulsa? Right. In fact, if anything, one of them got shipped off. So, I, I, I mean, the system that we have here, I imagine that it benefits some multinational in the U.S. somewhere without naming names. Uh, but mm -hmm. individual Americans are absolutely savaged by our current system. So, uh, you know, either quit it and just let everybody live the way they like, like Switzerland, just have no opinion on it. Uh, or mm -hmm. if you're going to get involved, maybe learn from how China does it, make it in everybody's interest, meaning not just the home country, but in our people's interest. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm in pretty much my entire adult life. The uh, United States has been at war. Right. Um, yeah. And it's been very, very, very expensive. And so 
fast forward, here we are today. And by the way, we, I, I think we live on, I want to turn to sort of domestic economy and, and talk about where we're at right now, because I think that's going to be of interest to a lot of folks, obviously. Uh, but, you know, as I as I cast around, there's, we're a tale of two worlds right now. We've got this small, tiny elite. They're doing fine, right? Because the Fed yeah. prints money and hands it out to them. And, and so they everybody seems to like that in that. We'll call it the 1% ban, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, but underneath that ban, there are varying degrees of, of desperation starting to really creep yeah. in, right? And in no small measure, it's because of this one thing that no political party, right? I, people are like, oh, you're bashing the left, you're bashing the right. I'm like, no, I bash both of them hard. Yeah. Because nobody's yeah. put up any effective opposition to this and said, listen, we, there's a cost to this. You can either have high-speed trains that take you silently from city to city and you know, a healthcare system that functions and gives you a decent longevity and maybe, you know, um, et cetera and so forth, or you can blow some people up over there. Right. And, and yeah. that's, that trade-off has not been explained by any politician except for Ron Paul, I guess, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, well, it has and, a cost though. Right. I mean, it's. Yeah, for sure. And what's amazing to me is that this should be an absolute no brainer for both parties. I mean, both parties surely have things they want to spend on. Surely they want to buy votes with those trillions of dollars that we spent in Afghanistan. I mean, just yep. just in self-interest, like Democrats, you know, wouldn't you prefer to go, I don't know, give free college to five million people? And it's just striking to me. I have to assume the lobbyists involved in the military industrial complex are just God level, uh, how they manage to do this year in, year out. Logically, neither party should support this at all. They should, you know, throw these guys out of the room. Uh, but again and again, and, you know, every week mm -hmm. you read the newspaper and, you know, they're excited about, uh, you know, maybe it's China or, or the, you know, Iran or I mean, it's just a never ending series. It's almost like venture capital, you know, like they invest in 100 little wars, you know, they put 50 guys in Peru and 30 guys in Syria. And, you know, you just kind of invest a little bit in all these little startups and see if you can spark any of them and get them going. And then, you know, you can cut the big money. But I mean, throughout this, like, aren't aren't politicians, uh, you know, aware? <laughs> I mean, don't they have something better to, you know, promise voters with all those dollars? Well, you would think, and and um, it turns out anybody who does come forward with a populist view gets gets tons of attention, but then they get savaged by yeah. our uniparty and unipress, on, which on, is part of the uniparty. Yeah, on you know? and and on both sides. I mean, we're seeing it with uh, with RFK at Absolutely. the moment, where he's they're not going easy on him. He's he's in their party. You would think it's among friends. It is not. Even Bernie Sanders, who you know he didn't really go off the reservation or anything in particular, but boy, they had a lot of problems with him. Uh, shutting him out. So, you know, increasingly, you, it's very, very narrow, and it's happening in both parties. It's very narrow, the range of opinions that you're allowed to have even to participate uh, in the um, conversation. You know, Bernie Sanders, he was he was trouble until he got the black house in the lake, uh, the black eye in the lake house, right? And then then he settled down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Taught him a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Straight down, hmm. Bernie. Straight up. All right. I want to I want to turn now to domestic um, politics a little bit here. I'm sorry, not politics. No, no, I hate no. politics. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in economics. So uh, thank you for the description on the BRICS, the gold back currency. I've got more questions, but maybe for another time, because I want to get to this part here. And let's go to um, let's see. So the Fed. Uh, so the Federal Reserve, you know, they, they're often presented as if um, they're this kindly, wonderful, you know, you had Grandma Yellen, you know, you've got, you know, you got kindly Uncle Powell, all that stuff. But the but and, and I've heard people say they've been audited. I can't find an actual audit. To me, Peter, a, an audit goes down to transactions, right? An audit isn't the Fed hands me a balance sheet and I add the numbers that they've given me and I call it square, right? Has right. the Fed ever been audited? It, 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 you would consider a full level that I'm aware of. It has not uh, the problem with assets. I mean, you see this with cryptocurrency companies where, you know, you've got to have an adversarial audit situation in order to get at the truth, right? If mm -hmm. somebody just presents you with their assets, well, okay. Are these impaired somewhere else? Are they collateral for some other loan? And you have no idea what the quality of the assets are, what the ownership is, if it's rehypothecated. Uh, so, you know, the Fed has numbers that it puts out. Uh, I imagine they bear some resemblance to reality. 
but honestly, we don't know. Um, there are a lot of things that the Fed is not supposed to be doing that we know it does, such as the plunge protection team that was mm -hmm. denied uh, very hard until they finally came out and said, well, of course we do it. Yes, everybody knew yeah, that. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. This is kind of par for the course. Deny, deny. And then, of course, of you're course. crazy to even question We always that. said that. Yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, the Fed, to a large degree, it skates on the fact that it has this amorphous gray area existence where it's neither a government organization nor is it a private organization. And I can't think of anything else in the country that exactly works that way. Uh, but the end result is that, you know, one of the most important tools that we have to control our government uh, to give transparency and sunlight uh, is FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. And under that act, anybody can request any piece of information from a public agency. And in the Fed's case, the regional feds are somewhat um, subject to FOIA uh, the FOMC, which is where the decisions are taken, that is not. So, for example, if Sam Bankman-Fried is having lunch with uh, Jerome Powell, we have no way of knowing this. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of Fed movements on both uh, crypto-related topics and on CBDCs. Uh, we 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 don't know what's happening there. Uh, and so for starters, like decide what the heck is the Fed? Is it run by the government or is it private? Because if it's private, uh, you know, I'm not sure where the constitutional authorization comes for the government to license a private firm to control the money supply. Uh, on the other hand, if it's government, then tell us exactly what's happening. Tell us, you know, what you own. Give us all the details. It needs to be an adversarial um, uh, audit which, by the way, that's true for the entire government, and they don't get it audited either. They just kind of report numbers. Uh, so mm -hmm. across the board, we need the Fed to actually, you know, it does it answer to the people, meaning does it actually have to tell the people what it's doing? If not, if it's this secretive, you know, I can't tell you because it's a trade secret. Well, okay, in that case, it's a private institution, in which case I'd say it's unconstitutional. Some private organization cannot take over the U.S. dollar. So, um I mean, this is an important point, and I do a lot of education around this. So the Federal Reserve is indeed a private corporation. It has capital stock. The capital stock on the last FOIA that we got, which was probably five, six years ago, showed that 73.8% yeah. of the New York Fed, which is inarguably the regional, they're not 12 equal regions. The Fed in the New York, that is the mothership. 73.8% uh, was owned by just two companies, JP Morgan yeah. and Citi, right? right. So. So that's just two companies. And of course, then they, as voting members, get to um, help with the selection process for who actually ends up in the presidencies and the directorships and all that other stuff. Exactly. Right. It's company. Right. And and that's not open to subject uh, to vote. I don't get to vote on that. And even yep. the fact that the chairman is appointed. the So in many of these cases where I saw like, you know, Fed presidents, I went and looked at it for a while. There was only one person on the ballot. So yeah. they got the presidency. Yeah. Who right. nominated them? I think I have an yeah. idea. Probably the top shareholders. <laughs> Just yeah. a theory I'm working on, right? You know, yeah, so absolutely. Right. And you know, the 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 president appoints some of the board members. Like it's it's very carefully structured that it's this vague gray area. Is it private? Is it public? Uh, and that's intentional, you know, because I mean it was it was uh, smoke and mirrors, right? The idea was to kind of sneak this thing in. A central bank was incredibly unpopular when they pitched it on the nation. Uh, it, it, there's a number of, I don't know if I can mention a famous book on the topic, but at any rate, um, uh, you know, there are a number G. of Edwards, G. Edwards, a personal Thank friend, you. so sure. Yes. Okay, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, we'll just hint at it. <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, he does a phenomenal job um, laying out the details yeah. of how they, they sold this turd sandwich. Uh, you know, they were very sneaky about it. They they designed it so it looks like it's decentralized. And, you know, they've got uh, all the banks are out in very homey sort of warm place or uh, uh, endearing places like Kansas City. You know, they want to make sure everybody yeah. knows this isn't just New York. Now, this was 100 percent New York. It was New York taking over the entire country, New York, meaning the mega banks in New York. And they've been running it that way ever since. It is, and you know, every problem that the Fed was alleged to fix, which you know, to wit, those are inflation and bank crises. They 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 are the source of both inflation mm -hmm. and bank crises. Uh, they are the only reason why we have inflation and bank crises. And you know, the reason is number one, the Fed 
prints money. It does this effectively by pushing interest rates too low. Uh, and then number two, because the Fed stands as a sort of standing permanent bailout for banks, that then encourages banks to get too risky. Okay, the way that you get too risky in finance, I mean, one really nice way to do it is 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 to issue money that you don't have, you know, so a fractional yeah. reserve and to take that too far and go too risky. You know, one of the sort of most important facts of finance is that risk pays, right? And so the easy way to make more money is to take more risk, right? And so once you've got the Fed standing as a bailout machine, anytime you get into trouble, then now the gamblers can go to the casino knowing that they get to keep their wins, but the taxpayer or functionally the dollar holders in the form of the Fed are going to cover the losses. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, 2008, <laughs> 2023, mm -hmm. again and again, because the Fed sets this up. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, Janet Yellen, Jerome Powell, they have these images. It's just sort of homespun common folk. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is always the game you play. Um, to the extent that you're ripping the people off, you got to put this layer on top of it that looks very comforting. And, you know, Jerome Powell with the Fed speak and, you know, it all sounds very calm and reasonable. And people don't even understand what's happening here, which is that Americans' wealth is being siphoned off by an inflation machine. And one of the side effects of that is the boom bust cycle recessions. And another side effect is bank crashes. And we are now getting to enjoy it. We're all being fleeced and we're on the hook for these bailouts. And it's all happening under the, you know, very calm, reassuring uh, guise of Chairman Powell. And I would submit there is a third side effect of all this, which is the concentration of the wealth in the hands of a Absolutely. few. Yep. You, yep. you know, this whole wealth gap, they write these articles about them like the Romans bemoaning a, a, a comet that just showed up. Nobody has any clue what the process is. So it's like, oh, look at this wealth gap. What could it be? Like, yeah. Uh, follow me to the Fed's balance sheet. It's called money printing. <laughs> and they they take all this money and they give it to their friends. It's not really yeah. complicated, you know, when you strip away yeah. some of the gobbledygook, you know, but it's just how it is. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. Assets, and, you know, financial assets. Uh, yeah. That's all they and, care about. Right. Um, because that's one of the main vehicles that they use to print the money is that it, it goes in the financial markets first. And indeed, if you look at the inequality numbers, uh, there's a Twitter account, it's a great account called WTF1971. That's, and yeah. he goes through all of the things that changed uh, when Nixon took us off gold. And I mean, it's it's across the board. It's it's every every social pathogen you can name absolutely took off. Uh, wealth inequality. I mean, just mm -hmm. it, because the ability to print unlimited money, number one, it grows the government so large that it starts breaking more and more things, bigger government, more things to break. You know, so you've got the, the breakdown in social order, the breakdown in family. And then exactly number two, you know, you now had an enormous amount of money that was flowing to rich people that would cause inflation. The inflation would eventually trickle down to poor people in the form of workers and, you know, people living on Social Security. But in that gap, that's the magic, right? Every single time that they print new money, it's like this ratchet that transfers more and more resources to the rich. Yep. I, I'm a big Milton Friedman character when it comes to inflation, because he said, you look, it, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. So yep. for a number of years, people are like, but there's been no inflation because we're talking about the price of milk. And I'm like, no, no, the money was given to Wall Street. Did you check the price of Gulfstream 650s, rare er, rare art, you know, big gems, oh, yeah. trophy properties, right. yachts? Those things were all through the roof because that the that's where the money went, right? So plenty of inflation, but also stocks and bonds. Remember, there was a time when, uh, Peter, the stocks were rising smartly and we had $19 trillion of negative yielding debt, which I still don't get as a concept. My brain breaks on that <laughs> in the European, well, the global markets, but mostly concentrated yeah. in Europe, right? It, it, how, you know, this is obviously you have inflation in the financial markets, not, but it's not called inflation. It's kind of like we have this robust GDP, but, but they forget to back out the debt accumulation, which is a silly right. concept, right? You you should back that out because it's not real GDP when the government goes six, five trillion into debt, right? So at any rate, with all of that, um, I said I was going to turn to to domestic uh, economy. Yes. I think this all is going to have to break soon. And 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 um, I'm on record saying that, which is a very bad thing for a forecaster to say <laughs> say these things. But I have said it um, in, in part because of some things. And I'm going to let me skip past this real quick because this should would be fun to get back to. But I do want to talk about first this um, for people looking at this, we're looking at in the upper left 
proceeding clockwise, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so the 30 largest industrial companies, the S&P 500, that's the top 500 uh, companies in the U.S. by market cap. The Eurostock's 50, their biggest companies in Europe. We have the NASDAQ, which is technology shares rotating around to the, say, 7 o'clock position, the DAX, that's the German DAX. And then we have the Nikkei 225. And all of these are five-minute, um, uh, no, these are, yeah, these are five-minute charts. This was the day that inflation was announced in the U.S., um, the last inflation rating. And for whatever reason, it caused all of these markets in the world to spike all at once within the exact same five-minute window. They almost tick for ticket. Peter, if you scrambled the names on these, I would have a hard time telling you who was who, even after studying it for a while. How do we account right. for global markets now trading in near-perfect synchronized lockstep? What do we make of that? Yeah, and the implication is that what matters overwhelmingly is no longer the real economy, right? It's not, you know, uh, uh, industrial growth in Japan or or this. Uh, rather, it's the financial flows. And so, you know, central banks worldwide at this point, I think, are just completely dominant. It is unhealthy that everything stops in New York for, you know, an hour when Jerome Powell speaks every six weeks, that is not a healthy economy because that is not actually a real thing, right? Yeah. Everything the Fed does, the Fed has nothing. It produces nothing. All it does is manipulate. That 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 is the purpose of a Fed is to manipulate the real economy. And so when you see these kinds of movements really worldwide, what is, uh, I think what it suggests to us is that these manipulations are increasingly overwhelming the real economy. Nobody really cares what's happening in this economy or that economy. The question is, are the central banks going to manipulate it this direction, the other direction? And of course, that manipulation, it, it's its a political process, right? On the one hand, they want to inflate as much as possible. On the other hand, they're afraid of voters getting upset if the numbers come in too bad, especially on inflation. And so now we've moved from a stock market that is measuring the real economy and that is you know, rewarding companies that make good products and, and uh, can satisfy customers and all of these things that are sort of good and honest. We move from that to this different world where we're sitting around analyzing whether the Fed is afraid of Elizabeth uh, Warren or you know, what the sort of micro dynamics are in the political fortunes of the Fed and therefore how it's going to manipulate the economy. This is deeply unhealthy, and every single manipulation, of course, destroys wealth, right? Anytime that you have a market where you've introduced some piece of noise, you know, like every Tuesday, 10% uh, of stocks have to be sold. Anytime you introduce some goofy noise, that is going to disturb markets. Uh, it's going to cause inefficiency. It's ultimately going to destroy wealth. If you now have a world economy that is dominated by the central banks acting in union, by the way, they all get together and they coordinate together so they can cover each other's rears. Uh, at that point, you have a recipe for trillions upon trillions being destroyed. And I mean, indeed, we saw this. I think in 2008, the numbers were at least several trillion uh, that were destroyed in that boom bust cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, every and we've had recessions, I think, since the beginning of the Fed, we're clocking along something like every six or seven years, maybe even more frequent. So yep. a substantial amount of what uh, humanity creates every year is siphoned off by these stupid manipulations. And then, of course, you have the political consequences, right? So every bust, uh, you end up getting this sort of field day on government growth. That's uh, Bob Higgs, Crisis and Le Leviathan thesis. One of the times that I, or one of the things I used to share in class was a uh, chart of regulations through the 2000s. Okay, and you've got all kinds mm. of government regulations. You have them on labor and environment and all these other things. And what's funny is that they're all kind of bumping along every year. Unfortunately, government creates more regulations than it gets rid of. So, you know, sort of gums things up little by little. But the funny part is that every single category of regulation soared in 2008, including environmental regulations. All right, now the 2008 crisis, I think by all accounts, had nothing to do with global warming. Right. So right. why did right, regulations on like battery efficiency, right? Why did these things soar? And the reason is because a crisis is an opportunity. Every time that you have mm. a economic collapse or indeed a war or a viral infection, uh, this can then, you know, kind of opens people up to the possibilities. Government universally grows during those episodes. So you can see why the Fed and why Treasury loves the situation we have today. You've got the central banks dominating the economy. They engineer crashes, right? Basically, they um, they 
they make money too easy. You get like a tissue flyer economy and then that crashes, right? So you've got this boom bust cycle periodically and every single one of them grows the government. They snap another two, three, five percent of GDP, which has brought us to today at this point where the federal government uh, in the US and Europe, increasingly in Japan, completely dominates the entire economy. That's never how it was supposed to be. The government is a parasite. It, it it should want the economy to, to do very well so that it can get more tax revenue and so it can buy more votes. But in fact, it doesn't seem to work that way. Instead, uh, you know, the 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 um, the entire economy at this point is is being led by government. Government is the band leader. And of course, government does not know how to grow an economy. No, it, it, that much is pretty obvious. So, you know, I, I do this part on. Um on inflation in, in, in one of the series I taught. And, and I show that under a gold standard, you know, we had periods where there was inflation, you know, you had the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, et cetera. But outside of the context of war, there was like a 200 year period where there was literally no inflation. Like it would go right. up, but it would come back to baseline. Now that's under the gold standard. Um, right. So fast forward, I, I'm at this uh, conference called Limitless, really wonderful conference. Ken McElroy, he's a very seasoned real estate investor there. He's got, you know, a billion plus under management. And he's given his pearls of wisdom. There's 1,400 people ready to absorb these financial words of wisdom. And, and how do I succeed the way you have, Kenny? And you know what the first chart he puts up? Because he's like, well, let's talk about next year. <laughs> he puts up the Fed dot plot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It used to be you could make plans based on what do you know? How good am I? Is Does the market want it? You know, And, and the money was yeah. just there to facilitate that. But now, literally, he's like, he, he can't make a move without trying to second guess what this silly dot plot, which is a range of opinions by Fed chair people and, and you know, FOMC committee members as to where the Fed stuff might be next year. And by the way, there's no worse, worse group of guessers ever. Oh, <laughs> those. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, well, I mean, you remember transitory inflation. They have no idea what they're doing. Uh, you know, this is why they have the quasi religious trappings, you know, with the, all of the ceremonies. It's almost like choosing a new pope. You know, everybody sort of yeah. stands there bent on one knee waiting for Jerome Powell, St. Jerome to come out. Uh, and they need all that because they, they they have the foggiest idea what they're doing. Uh, they they just muddle through. They They do crap. They respond to whatever comes up. The metaphor I like is they're like a car driving at night with no headlights. They have no idea what's in front of them. Uh, they have yep. the additional disadvantage that when they try to steer the economy, uh, it 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 takes time. They can't really predict how it works. You know, if the Fed tries to throw some money in this or or fiddle with this interest rate, they they never exactly know uh, how it's going to work out. So they're a car driving at night, very fast, no headlights, and the steering wheel kind of sometimes works. Like you would stop driving, right? You would probably, <laughs> I mean, yeah. pull over, man, quit it. Like stop <laughs> manipulating the economy because all they know how to do is break it. Yeah. So um, I, I'm, I'm this kind of a guy. I, I collect data. I collect dots. Uh, for point of reference, my grandfather and his father and his father, all bankers and, and uh, regional bank in upstate New York. So my grandfather actually served for a two-year period at the New York Fed under Paul Volcker, right? Oh, but this wow. is back yeah. when- when banking was a very different sort of a beast. And yep. my grandfather, were he alive, would not even remotely recognize the interventionist thing because back then it was the discount window, very sparingly punishing terms, right? You know, like that's you, right. They really slapped a cane on you to, to use that. Um, and and now it's I, my sense is they intervene on an almost hourly basis um, if they yeah. have to. And so the dot I connected was I was reading, it was this little article in Reuters, three paragraphs. And it was, they said, oh, in, in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, the continuity of operations uh, of the Fed, New York Federal Reserve moved its trading desk to Aurora, Illinois, you know, just to get away from the coast. And I was like, Aurora, isn't that where the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is located? Why would you want to co-locate your trading desks to within spitting distance <laughs> of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where all the high leverage VIX options, treasury options, futures on stocks, all that stuff. Why would you want to co-locate? I mean, they just sort of randomly threw it out there like, well, we just picked a place. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> oh, and then and then later, uh, 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 Ben Bernanke is going to become chief macroeconomist for Citadel, whose average length of holding is like a quarter second or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is astounding. The um, the revolving door. And, you know, this is true. I mean, really across the economy. 
Uh, you know, if you join the SEC, I'm certain that uh, you will have offers for lunch dates with the companies that you're supposed to be regulating and that they'll have conversations about what a bright future you have. Not yet. Not yet. Keep doing what you're doing right now, kid. But in a couple of years, call me and we'll we'll find a great spot for you. Um, it's very and, you know, the point you made about your father and grandfather, the stereotypes of bankers used to be that they were extremely conservative, uh, kind of like how people think of accountants, right? They were very careful, very meticulous. Um, you know, they needed a lot of proof before, you know, they would take a big move. And then yeah. that flipped, right? So starting the 1980s now, the stereotype of a banker is he has an exciting social life, uh, much of it which he pays for. Uh, <laughs> we <laughs> won't get into the details, but, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's a very, very different stereotype of bankers. And I think that's a direct consequence of Nixon going off gold. Once you're off mm -hmm. gold, the sky is the limit. I mean, the more risk uh, you take, the more you're going to be rewarded. Uh, and then at that point, you know, the, the incentive for the bank is to more or less drive as fast as possible, as close to the cliff as possible. That's how you make money. And then just make sure that you've uh, paid your lobbyists enough that when the bill comes due, they're going to shift it over the taxpayer. And I mean, that's completely what we saw in March uh, between yep. the uh, what was it? Um, the Fed's, B, yeah, the, the BTFP. Uh, and then the FDIC expansion. So, you know, we saw this potentially right. $10 trillion pre-bailout. And I mean, that had those bank lobbyists' fingerprints all over it. You guys lost a bunch of money. No problem. We'll cover it. Now, we in this context, if it's the FDIC, it means that they're going to tax it out of all Americans' bank accounts. If it's the BTFP, it's a combination of taxpayers and everybody who owns dollars. So it, it's, you know, banking has completely transformed now into really a risk production industry. It's it's no longer providing capital, it's providing risk. Yeah. Now, it's it, very astute when you mentioned, my, I remember a story my grandfather told me, which was that back when he was a young man, this is coming just out of the Great Depression um, era, so this yeah, mid-30s or so, he was thinking of going into the family business, which was a bank, and his father did everything he could to talk him out of it. He said, look, this is a this is a 4% margin business. It's fraught with risk. You, nobody <laughs> smart would ever go into this business, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it was at that time also, coincidentally, about 4% of the overall economy and financialization by some measures is as much as 40% of what we do yeah. now. Uh, and you can read Will Durant's books on, on, on Athens when they started debasing their currency. And it reads almost exactly like what you read today because humans respond to incentives. And if I can make money taking risk and working hard and having to manage people and inventories and doing all that, or I could make a hundred times that amount clickety clicking, speculating, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. Your best and your brightest go over here and begin speculating um, because humans incentives, it's almost like there's a connection there. You know? Yeah, for sure. And, and especially if taxpayers are on the hook every time you screw up, holy cow. I mean, why, why, like, where did I go wrong? Wait a minute. Wait, I know. <laughs> what what am I doing here? I should be, I should go take risks, you know, more or less gamble in crypto markets and then uh, pass it on to taxpayers. Yeah, absolutely. So um, carrying on, I want to just look at, at a couple slides. We'll just, um, we'll just talk over them. So what about, um, what about, and thanks for your explanation on that. So here we have, uh, this is consumer credit, total net change. Uh, you can clearly see it's on a on a downswing right here towards the right side of this chart. Um, consumer credit is starting to nose over a little bit. Um, I connect that to this idea. This is the Fed's balance sheet here. Uh, this is what uh, 8.6 trillion at its peak. There's that orange line sort of peaks and then noses over. You can see that's where the Fed's starting to reduce its balance sheet. It's nosing over and then oops, see that pop there towards the right side. That's the Fed throwing $400 billion into the markets in October mm -hmm. of 2022 because I assume they got they got a little worried about something there. Um, but they are winding it back down, and we are now for the last three weeks below that level it hit over here before it – let me see if I can get my drawing tool out here. Um, yeah, over here – before this happened here, we're now, we're now down about that same level. So – Peter, do you, do you think is the Fed actually serious? Are they gonna are they gonna tighten until something breaks here, or do they have another plan? Do you think? 
Yeah, I think that's their fear. You know, uh, so the Fed had a relatively small balance sheet throughout its history. And starting in 2008, it just massively grew. And the promise at the time was that once the storm has passed, don't worry, we're going to reverse this all. We're going to get rid of, um, you know, all of these assets that are held by the Fed. Uh, and they started to do that just a little bit. They kind of dipped a toe and they got a couple of taper tantrums where markets just could not digest it. And that surprised them. Uh, I think they figured it would be easy to unload the stuff as it was to pick it up in the first place. Uh, in late, Yeah. And then in late 2019, they had some drama coming out of uh, repo markets as well. And in both cases, the Fed seems to have gotten scared and felt like it cannot uh, predict what happens when it unwinds all of those assets that it bought up. And so at this point, I think the Fed knows that it's an experimental territory. It knows that, you know, last time it tried unwinding these huge purchases, which remember, there's a brand new thing, right? Before 2008, the Fed did not jump in and buy up all these assets, quantitative easing. Uh, but now they do. And the depending on how you count it, two or three times that they've tried unwinding that, uh, things have broken. Uh, and so <laughs> um, I think they're concerned. I think a lot of us are concerned. Uh, I mean, indeed, in a sense, the banks broke right on schedule in that sort of hypothesis where the Fed unwinding starts to break things. Uh, we really don't know what breaks next. We had uh, in other countries, we've also had similar issues where, you know, UK uh, interest rates went really almost to third world level uh, and that threatened UK pensions. The Japanese yen has just been bizarre. I mean, it's it's past 140. Uh, it's almost looking like Argentina's currency at this point. So that is, I think, the fear in the markets that if they try to pull back, and by the way, the reason they have to pull back is that all that huge balance sheet represents money that they effectively printed. Okay. So those are the proceeds of all the money that they sit on an Excel sheet and they type out a bunch of zeros and they say, I have, I have discovered this is money. Let's all pretend this is money. And then they flood that out of the market. Right. And so they know on some level that the way to reverse that, the way to bring back inflation is to unwind that process, right. To, you know, essentially buy up all those dollars. So that's why they're trying to do it. But I think even the Fed does not know if it's going to break something. Now, the alternative might have been don't do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, all of those trillions that they printed in 2020 and 2021, uh, they might have just left the economy open and then maybe they wouldn't have had to print, what was it, six or seven trillion. So it would have been really nice if they had done that instead. But the way it is, and, you know, this happened in 2008, it happened now in 2020, they don't have an appropriate level of humility to not screw around with things that they don't understand. And, you know, even Ben Bernanke back in 2008, he was very open about it. He said, I don't really know if this will work, but if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And that really evokes FDR. I mean, that that that's what gave us the depression in the first place is that FDR, he had no idea what he was doing. Uh, he just kind of broke things one by one, and maybe this will fix it. Maybe this will fix it. You know, so he had income tax rates of 92%. What do you know? Companies didn't produce amazingly. Uh, he, of course, broke the gold standard. Uh, you know, just across the board, he just he saw the economy wasn't doing too well because you know they had, had a stock market crash. Uh, Hoover had screwed up a lot of things, and so FDR came in and said, "Well, let's just I don't know. Let's just let's just flick all the switches and see if the plane." Uh, levels out and mm -hmm. guess what that does not work it's 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 reckless well it's because these we're trying to control the uncontrollable these are complex systems they have emergent yep. behaviors and you got to be delicate with them because you never quite know what you're going to kick off and and so as we close out this public part and by the way um peter and i will be continuing this conversation and we will be um uh let's just say unplugged um as we carry on <laughs> with this whole thing because we're, we're believe it or not we're holding back um so i do want to talk about where where I think this is going. So this actually, this is a chart, Peter, that that keeps me up a little bit. Um, and this is bank credit, all commercial banks. So the Fed prints, they they push that rope out into the marketplace, right? They, they have all those trillions of dollars. But if those dollars just get round tripped and put back at the Fed and, and so-called excess reserves, which is 
good work if you can get it. Free money, then get 5% on it. That's tasty. Mm -hmm. But leaving that aside, uh, the banks are supposed to go out and lend it. And, and that's what creates the actual economic activity. The Fed can print all it wants, but this is the proverbial pushing on a string. If it prints and nobody does anything with it, they've just pushed on a string. Nothing's happened. So here we are. Uh, this is a this one catches me because we only have one moment in all of history of, of credit going back to like the 40s, which is when it started being uh, measured, where we saw credit go into negative territory. That was in 08. Oh, that was in context of 08, 09. That mm -hmm. was when you saw Hank Paulson write his uh, you know memoir saying we were within hours of a complete banking collapse. Right. This whole systemic failure, systemically important thing got born in that. But what really happened was we have a system that is designed to perpetually expand. As long as it's expanding, it's happy. If it's not expanding, it gets all collapsy. Those are that's a binary state, like Trump yep. merely expanding exponentially or getting busy scaring everybody with with the prospect of systemic failure. How do you what what do you take away from this chart? How do how do you, what does this say to you? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, banks at this point are uh, scared. They're partly scared because the economy is slowing. They're partly scared because of the banking crisis that we just went through. And, you know, the way that they fixed the banking crisis with, was with those kind of pre-bailouts. But all of those, they were sort of put out in a discretionary way where they can decide who's going to get them going forward. And so the mega banks feel very confident. The regional banks especially, they have no guarantee. They do not know. Uh, if you know if if they collapse, will they get taken care of, or will they be sold off in a you know vulture swoop from one of the mega banks? And really across the board, we've had a lot of data saying that banks are afraid to lend. Now, if they don't lend, as you said, that means that all that money that the Fed is pumping out, it just becomes a handout. Like it has no economic effect. It just passes right through into the pocket. Uh, bankers, which is um, indeed excellent money, uh, if your lobbyists can get it. And, you know, we've had stories, for example, of large developers. There was one, uh, this is out of Bloomberg, and they said they had a like a 25 story project. It's a pretty serious project. These guys had a long history. They've been doing this for generations. And they said that they lost financing partway through. They called over 100 banks and nobody would finance it. Right. We're seeing uh, con uh, consumer credit is being tightened now, even though rates of so credit card rates are up to 21 percent. So the banks are clearly mm -hmm. getting paid for it. But even so, they're afraid of consumers at this point. So uh, historically, when we get credit contracting like that, you always get a recession. Now, in terms of predictions, it's worth noting that we it, it is entirely possible that we won't have a recession in the next couple of years. I think we probably will, but it's possible that we don't. And the reason is because the underlying real economy is still productive, right? Americans get up every morning, they build stuff. There's millions of American businesses who are constantly trying to improve. So it is possible that the number stays above zero. I think unlikely, but it could happen. But the thing to remember here is that the question is not whether it stays, you know, whether the bouncing ball stays above zero. The question is, what would it have been? In other words, how much has been destroyed in this massive boom, you know, whether it's housing or asset markets? We had trillions of wealth that were handed to people during the inflation and the, you know, the original money printing uh, from 2020. And, you know, now you've got a lot of poor people who are having trouble. They are paying back the other end of that. There's a number that came out recently, it's from Lending Tree, that one in 10 Americans are buying groceries on installment, right? So we have transformed the economy from or towards one where, you know, there's this giant vortex sucking money from people at the lower end, and especially uh, the working class, uh, the middle class, right? So it's sucked from them, it's given to richer people. Uh, so whether or not, you know, we get a literal... Uh, recession, whether or not we literally cross under 0% and for how long we do, if we look at these individual dynamics, there are a ton of people uh, who are in pain, who cannot get credit. If you if you could get credit and you suddenly can't, it's because something happened to you. Okay. It's not just, you know, it, it either mm -hmm. happened to you or the bank is afraid of something much larger happening specifically to you because the question at issue is the loan to you. So yeah. I think that we are going to see a lot of pain going forward. I, I I'm pretty hard to shock in this regard, but uh, I've been I've actually 
been shocked at the grocery store of late. Um, yeah. And one of the other things that I'm I'm pretty certain of is that our government institution charged with measuring inflation does a a singularly directionally bad job at that. It's always undercounting it um, in various ways, and it has all of its various statistical tricks to to do that. But I'm noticing now new behaviors, and I'll tell you what it was, Peter. It was a comment somebody left at my site, and they said that they were starting to see new behaviors in the grocery store, including uh, that both elderly people were coming, you know, in a partnership were coming to the store and they were, you know, carefully weighing, you know, their options and having conversations like, you know, can we actually get this chicken for Sunday wow. dinner? Can we afford yeah. this? Right. Like they're seeing this behavior change. Um, and, you know, as well, of course, you see all the cars and the food lines and things like that. But this is real pain. And I don't see anybody really talking about it at the political or the political Fed level, really talking about it. They always minimize it. They're, you know, if politicians weren't gaslighting us, what would they be doing? You know, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So I, I just I, I just look at this and, and it's it's hard for me not to be just really bearish. And I don't just see this as like a we we screwed up. We printed too much in, in the context of March 2020. This has been going on for decades, and it's just one of yep. those. I feel like, you know, there's only so much further we can kick the can down the road. I believe there's another kick or two, but there aren't an infinite number of kicks in this story. What, what do you think about that? Do, do you see that there's just a, a do we finally wake up and go through the painful austerity and fly this, you know, level the ship out? Or does this or is this some sort of like bricks, gold back currency thing that sort of sneaks up on us and the dollar really gets smashed? And and we have to finally confront it, but it's going to either way, it's going to be painful. The question is, <laughs> are we going to do this to ourselves or is it going to happen to us? Or do you have another point of view on this? Yeah, I think it's always a combination. I think the fall of the Roman Empire is a nice pattern. So on the one hand, the Visigoths and you know all these tribes came in and, and ravaged the empire. But the collapse of Rome didn't happen on that day. Okay, the collapse of Rome was the reason why the Visigoths showed up, right? What? Why did they no longer fear the legions? Uh, we see this throughout history. Uh, the Song Dynasty, which was the Chinese dynasty that that uh, the same process happened, and then the Mongols took over China and and turned that into uh, the machine they did. Um, throughout history, it rots from the inside, and then you have some outsider who sees an opportunity. And I think you know, in this moment, the most likely. Uh, face on that opportunity is China, uh, perhaps extended with its you know satellites at BRICS. But I think that that is the most likely way that it ultimately collapses. And you know, gold backed uh, would be a huge hit. Uh, ironically, so far, I think that if anything, China has actually given us a given our system a longer lease on life uh, because mm -hmm. it had such massive productivity gains. Uh, you and I remember when like an iron, like buying an iron to iron your clothes, that was like a major purchase. You had to like sit down and, and weigh the cost benefit and you had to think it through. Mm -hmm. And I mean, nowadays, what are they like 12 bucks? Uh, well, okay, they're higher now. But in terms of, yeah. you know, you could work at McDonald's and own your own iron now. Uh, th just things got fantastically cheap. And I think in a lot of ways, what that meant is that uh, it brought inflation down. Rightly, what should have happened is that we should have gotten consumer price inflation in the U.S. and then everybody in the U.S. should have gotten richer. Instead, what happened, of course, is that all of those Chinese productivity gains, it's not just China, it's, it's you know, globalization, the fact that you can have a factory in Mexico and, and all these places, all of that got siphoned away and fed by this, um, you know, money creation process to the rich. Uh, so I think that in a sense that bought it probably another cycle in terms of how many cycles we have left. It is tricky because we don't know um, how the Visigoths, how the, the outsiders, uh, are they going to exploit it? Are they going to learn to live with it and want to sustain it? Uh, is China eventually going to be in a situation where it treats us the way it treats an African country where it basically says, look, I don't want you to be unstable because I want you to buy my goods. Uh, <laughs> um, it, I, I think it'd be shocking for Americans if the relationship got to that point. But what it does mean is that that could give more life to the system, that perhaps China is not actually being predatory, that they're just trying to uh, keep everything calm so that they can continue making money. So I think that we all know how the book ends. Uh, you know, if you go back through history, there have been many eras where humans got into fiat money. It's like a drug. Once you start it, uh, it's pretty hard to stop without... Uh, you know, having a crisis, it 
you know, it can take 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been times where it took like 10 years, depending on the self-control of the government. The people who run central banks today are aware that money printing causes inflation. That's helpful. That's better than most mm -hmm. regimes in the past. Uh, so they do do what they can to try to control it. And, you know, they they know how to fix it. For example, you know, the Fed pulling down its balance sheet or cranking up interest rates. They know mechanically how to end inflation. Uh, and so now the question is, do the pressures on them become so great that at some point they 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 give up or they get overwhelmed by external factors? If I had to bet, I think that the system as it currently stands probably has a couple more decades um possibly longer and that they'll just keep doing more of what they've been doing so fleecing regular people more concentration of wealth among the rich the rich of course have access to the political process they can hire lobbyists they can fund activist organizations and so they buy self-protection we see this in living color at the moment and so i would expect that to continue well fantastic um will you have uh, time to continue this conversation absolutely if we yeah. carry on all right, so we're going to end this part here out in public now. So please tell people where they can follow you and um, all of that. Uh, sure, I'm on Twitter, uh, which is a fun platform now. So at Prof Stonge, P-R-O-F-S-T-O-N-G-E. I also put out a newsletter and I've got a brand new website going up. It's still a bit clunky, but it's at PeterStange.com. Well, fantastic. All right, with that, everybody, we're going to carry this on over at Peak Prosperity and... Um, this will be unplugged. Peter, thanks so much for your time for this section. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on.